Hi, Brit Maniacs. I'm here with Shane Bach, and we are at uh, Airvent, EAA AirVenture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and we're standing in front of a very unique plane. And Shane, can you tell us a little bit about Yeah, this is a short Sherpa. It's made by Short Brothers out of uh, Belfast, Ireland. And uh, they made civilian versions of this that was a 30-passenger aircraft. And then they made the military version, which is a C-23. And this happens to be an A model of the C-23. It came to the Forest Service in 91 from, directly from the uh, US Air Force. They operated this airplane over in uh, uh, Europe, primarily in Germany and kind of the Cold War era. And uh, they were using this primarily for hauling uh, F-16 engines and F-100 engines and F-111 engines, I guess, and uh, so it was kind of a, a specialized just get parts to the different air bases that they had over at that time. So just a, a specialized cargo plane, basically. Yeah, it is cargo plane. value cargo plane. Yep. We're the ones that use it as a, as a jump aircraft, a mission aircraft for smoke jumpers. And, uh, so what's a smoke jumper? Okay, so a smoke jumper, yes. So they're the wildland firefighters that uh, are very ex highly experienced firefighters that have decided that they want to step it up a little bit and actually deploy from an aircraft using parachutes. So they jump yeah. out of they, the airplane. They jump the out of the airplane and, and uh, not into the fire, <laughs> into the fire but zone. real close to the fire so that they can have a quick response time to the wildland fires that typically don't have roads to them. And where are you based? I'm based out of Missoula, Montana, and I've uh, been there for 16 years now doing this mission. I got on with the Forest Service back in 98 flying these aircraft uh, in Redmond, Oregon. That was where I started out. Yeah. So the, the U.S. Forest Service has these deployed wherever fires may be. Yeah. Well, we have uh, bases throughout the western U.S. and uh, the uh, base of Missoula, Montana is where I'm from. There's Redmond, Oregon. Redding, California, uh, just to name a few. There's uh, Grangeville, Idaho, and McCall, Idaho. Uh, Winthrop, Washington, and then we have one in West uh, West Yellowstone. And it's the Sherpa, it's the short Sherpa. Is this the primary plane used by the Forest Service? For the Forest Service, uh, the Forest Service owns uh, the Sherpas and uh, a couple of twin otters. Okay. And uh, then we do contract out to contract companies that fly the Casa 212 and also a Dornier 228. And uh, then some of them also contract twin otters sure. and stuff. Can you show, show us some features that make this plane unique? Yeah. So, uh, well, one thing that makes it really unique is that uh, these military C-23s, there's only 62 of them ever made. Oh. So the Air Force had 18 of them. The Army had a 42 or 44 of the uh, B models. Sure. This is an A model. This ramp door is uh, specifically made for cargo, loading and unloading on the ground, and uh, it cannot open up in flight. Oh. So all of our jumpers and cargo has to go out this rear side door here. So every, all the cargo has to be packaged in a sizable amount so that it can go out that. And it goes out with a parachute? Yep, they, each individual piece goes out with a oh. parachute, and uh, I'm dropping them about uh, 150 to 200 feet off the ground. Well, that's enough for yeah. the parachutes to deploy? Yeah, for that's the, the cargo, oh. but that's all for uh, for accuracy, because okay. the windage, you know, the yeah, higher yeah, you get, the, it's gets to be a crapshoot kind of. Yeah. Sounds like but, you've done this a lot. <laughs> yeah, the jumpers, they'll go out at 1,500 feet, okay. and the uh, and on the round canopy, and then on the ram airs, they go out at 3,000. Sure. But so this door here uh, is built to actually, if you had it level with the floor, it's structurally capable of uh, a palletized cargo to be forklift onto it, oh, wow. and it's five. It can, it can rate it up to 5,000 pounds. Oh, that's um, and it's also built stout for a, a jeep to actually drive up. And uh, we can haul Jeeps in there. The military did, you know. Yeah. Not that we would, but uh, so. Um, the B model, the one added feature that the B model will do is that it has the exact same door, articulates just like you see it, but once it's shut and we've taken off, now this becomes the hinge point up above, oh, wow. and the whole door will raise inward to the ceiling, Push and the now we can send out palletized cargo for the 
fire effort. So I mean, you're looking forward to the, the upgrade? <laughs> yes, yes. The, for, and more particular for the added horsepower that the, oh, okay. they had a little bit more uh, horsepower in their engine. So <laughs> it's just an upgrade all around. It is an upgrade yeah. all around. So that's happening now, the upgrade? It, it is, and we've got four of them online. And then the other upgrade that we've been doing to them is putting the Garmin G1000 flight deck up front. Okay. So we are, you know, synthetic vision and uh, the all the, the bells and whistles. The latest upgrade. The latest upgrade. Can we go inside? Absolutely. Come on board. Is this a winch here? No, this isn't a winch. This is the, the vertical stanchion that the uh, jumpers will hook up to. Okay, right. They'll hook up to this. They'll get in the door. The spotter, he's looking out the door, checking to see that we're getting to the exit point. And as soon as the, the spotter says they're there, he'll just step back and slap them on the back and then they go out. out the door. Uh, the, never has to push anyone? Yeah, no, <laughs> no I, I help them out. I just tell them that the day that they trained us to do landings, I miss that day. Yeah. <laughs> and then they go out pretty easily. Okay. <laughs> Don't have to talk of it. That's too. great. So if we end up having to have, a, a, you know, an emergency situation, uh, an engine sure. gave up the, the ghost for us, the, we do have this uh, emergency stanchion line. And they'll all hook up in single file, and instead of rushing the door and getting my FCG all yeah. messed up, uh, they'll just go one at a time in a pretty orderly fashion, and, and that would be our, our emergency. So they can all deploy yeah. more or less one at a time. One at a time, and, and they'd rather take well, their chances the out there days, than yeah. with me. <laughs> <laughs> so is this all controls for you? You say, what's the, what was the person's name? Uh, yeah, they call them the spotter. Spotter. So yeah. back here, basically, we've got the radio to sure. Talk to up above or up front. Yeah. So as I'm flying, he's telling me, "Okay, hey, there's the spot that we want to, uh, you know, yeah. use as our jump zone." And so then it's my job to get us over that. And he'll throw out a streamer, find out the windage, and then uh, he'll ask me to do one more pass streamers to spot, and then he'll kind of gauge to find out where that exit point is. Sure. And then it's my job to to fly streamers to spot about 10 different times yeah, or five different times to get all 10 jumpers out because they're going out two at a time. Two at a time, okay. Yeah. And you have a three-man crew, is that? Uh, or is it two? two? Two pilots and two spotters. Oh, two spotters. So it's four a four-person stays with the airplane, the, the other 10 they're, all go out. They're not afraid of your landing. <laughs> yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> they take, but they have a chute just in yeah, case. Just in case. <laughs> Do you all, 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 the, all the crew have chutes? Uh, yeah, well, no, the pilots don't. They have to go back with the ship. You're talking about the plane. <laughs> I guess we we're going back with it, not down, but yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I hear. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no lifeboats in the Navy. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right. It's, it's, it's good, uh, it's good uh, incentive to make sure the ship doesn't go that's, down. That's right, that's right. <laughs> So, uh, pretty much the, the controls for this door are here, but the, the spotter doesn't really have to do anything with that because we're this doesn't we're open up ground, in flight, yeah. so uh, it's just ground ops only. But the next generation will. Yeah, the next generation, they'll have the capability, and then it's actually, the controls are up here, oh. and they will, <laughs> it will raise the, the door up into the ceiling, and then this would be, you would be already out of the airplane, and <laughs> we'd be going out there. What, when were these planes built? This one was built in 84. So 84, um, so they're, they're getting up there, dude. Yeah, yeah, we're 30, 30 plus years now. Yeah. Uh, how long do you think they had? Well, uh, we're retiring this A model after this year. The B models, uh, as we're upgrading with the new flight decks, keeping up to, to today's technology, um, the plan is to operate them for the next 20 years. Wow. So, so what happens when they retire? Do they sell them? They mothball them? Possibly what will happen with these A models is that uh, uh, they'll get auctioned off. Uh, the other possibility is, is that a lot of the airframe components can transfer over to a B model, so it may be uh, a cannibalized bird right. for the keep the rest of the fleet well, going. That's what you yeah, especially if there's is that 60 made. <laughs> yeah, no, 62 of these 62. made, and uh, but you know. I know if we were to end up auctioning them, that this is a relatively young airframe because it only has uh, 10,000 hours on it. So there's uh, a lot of companies that would probably, you know, jump at an opportunity right, to get right. a, such a low-time aircraft. Yeah, so maybe there would be either like a, a parachuting company or a yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking something like uh, car air cargo ca yeah. carriers and stuff like that. So we can move yeah, forward up in the air. Plane. So how many? How many? How many? 
smoke jumpers would yep. typically be in. Our typical load is uh, 10 smoke jumpers. These are the seats that they'll sit in. Uh, these are called simulus seats for whatever reason, but they're side-facing seats. Sure. And uh, they've got cargo underneath. And we've got a lot of uh, cargo that they'll have along the sidewall. And uh, so after the jumpers are out the door, it's the spotter's job to go and unpack all this cargo and get them ready for throwing out. Yeah. And then so when I'm on the cargo run, coming down 150 feet, I'll be doing a cadence, a short final standby kick. Yeah. And when he hears that kick, that's got to go out right yeah. then so that hopefully I'm accurate enough and the, and the uh, the cargo is not in a tree, but on the ground, right. safe and sound for them to use. If it's in the tree, it's probably a six pack for the person that had to climb the tree or cut the tree down, whichever. Oh, wow. And this is what the jumpers look like when they're going out. This is a suit that's made of uh, Nomex and Kevlar and a lot of padding that's sewn into it. If you felt there, there's is that something jump over. into a forested area? That is yeah, if, if you know, the, they try to avoid the trees, but it's not a hundred percent. And if they do make themselves in, get themselves into a tree, they've uh, uh, got a lot of protection. Yeah. Their mask is even protecting them from branches, okay, branches. getting into their face. Yeah. Uh, then if they're in the tree, they've got this rope here. Uh, that's a let down rope, then they, they got a procedure for uh, tying up and letting, letting themselves down. down. Okay. And uh, they go out like with. It's happened before. <laughs> it's, it's happened. <laughs> they uh, go out with a, uh, a PG bag, this okay. personal gear bag. Sure. And that's about, typically they tell me about 45 pounds. And it's got some food and water to get them through the first shift. Sure. Uh, and their radios and all that kind of stuff. The reserve chutes on the front, they've got their main chute on the back. This is an example of a round chute system. Okay. Uh, they've got a square ram air system that's similar, but looks a little different. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what they're going out looking like. <laughs> After they're on the ground, they shed all that, and they've got no mesh pants like I'm wearing, and uh, uh, yellow fire shirt here okay. that uh, that's no max sure. and high no visible is, is yeah fire resistant it, it, fire resistant to an extent you know sure. but uh, it'll uh, protect you to to, uh, to a certain extent and uh, but the yeah and it's highly visible yeah. so that we the retardant planes can see them on the ground and hopefully not drop the retardant on yeah. which isn't a hundred percent that happens yeah. still too <laughs> And uh, so then we can move forward. Up here is uh, an example of the fire boxes okay. that, uh, that go out and holds their food and water and tools, that, okay. like the Pulaski. It looks like a, uh, it's a dual purpose tool. It's got an ax on one side of the head and then the other side is like a, a digging hole. Okay. Yeah. And sure. uh, so that's all in there. And they get thrown out after them. They get thrown out. This is what's going out at 150 feet above the yeah. ground. And not Away with it. Exactly. <laughs> and it's got a small chute attached to it. Okay, and uh, they got a, a thing that hooks on to that stanchion so it's, it's you know static line yeah. deployed. Excellent. As soon as it goes out the door, the chute opens and and as long as I'm 150 or better, it'll actually open up and, and you know have a vertical drop. And it's, it's in a box because if it burns up, it's okay. Yeah. We don't the, care. <laughs> and, and you know, whatever they drop and take in with them, they have to pack that out. Yeah. So a lot of times it's things like that that they can burn in the fire and get yeah. rid of, they don't have to carry out. Yeah, the less they can have to carry out, the better. The tools come back, the box. Yeah, exactly. This is an example of a uh, chainsaw box. Okay. So there's a chainsaw, barn chain oil, and uh, fuel enough for several cycles for uh, sure. running the chainsaw. That has to be carried out. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's also got a chute attached to it. Yep. Um, and the spotter, typically um, when we're taking off, we've got this seat and then there's a seat back at the end there, at the tail end for the spotter. And this window open in flight or is that when we... No, no, that's, that would be like the suicide door in some cars. Is. It's opening the you wrong way. Close, yeah, yeah, you'd never get it closed. But, uh, and then this big large door can be used for loading cargo. Forklift can come up and set things and so we actually have a roller system if we're just yeah. doing cargo Locks that can in hawk into the floor. Yep. And uh, we can roll pallets yeah. down. 
Um, and so it is big so, enough for typical pallets, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A typical pallet. Up in Alaska, we've done a lot of uh, cargo missions up there, and we'll have about five pallets deep in here and uh, carry about you know four or five thousand pounds of cargo. So what's the, what's the weight capacity go to? So it? You, our payload is seven thousand five hundred pounds, and uh, so you know if you got four thousand pounds of of cargo. You can carry three three thousand five hundred pounds of fuel, so yeah. <laughs> which equates to about three and a half hours okay. endurance. So, so and how far <laughs> would that typical range? Uh, as I see here, probably about oh three and a half, okay, one seventy, three forty. About six, no, seven hundred miles. Okay, so how many times did you have to stop? Uh, yeah. Yeah. One, one stop from Montana. We uh, stopped in uh, Rapid City. Okay. That was a good stop. We were avoiding weather to the yeah. north. Nope. Otherwise, Bismarck would have been a little bit uh, more direct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is this, so this door never opens in flight? Though, this no, is not in flight. Uh, and then in this door, there's actually another emergency exit, okay. just like this one on right sure, would be in bar. here. Yep. But uh, so. Okay. So uh, the spotters sit here right, when they're right. in yep. operations? Well, one spotter here and one the spotter oh, in the back the seat there, there, typically. And this is kind of unique yeah. for the, the cockpit. Most aircraft, you're the entering right. from the middle, yeah, yeah. and is this one, you're entering from both sides. So i uh, not sure how you get a camera up here. But uh, I can come up to the side here, and you can come in on the other, other direction. You can go ahead and climb up into the seat there. Watch your head. Wow. It's cozy. It is cozy. 1980s technology. Yeah, look at that. All steam gauges. Uh, pretty <laughs> actual, much exactly actual, the way it came to us. Actual uh, analog gauges. Look at yeah, that. Yeah, the, uh, the only thing that we've really changed is that, that they had an old INS system in here that we replaced with the Garmin 430s. Sure. Um, yeah, I remember when I actually first tired on, when they still had the INS in there. And every morning, part of my pre-flight was is to tell the INS where the airplane really was. So you had to, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you had to zero. Zero, yeah, zero it zero out. It out. <laughs> well, I look at that. You have like an iPad that clips in yep. there. Yeah, yeah. That, I got the iPad. I use for flight, and uh, uh, that's our flight bag, electronic yeah. flight bag. That's cool. So yeah. it is cozy up here, isn't it? It is cozy. It's got a pretty good view. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm surprised how narrow the the, the, yeah, the actual, yeah. actual screen is. The other thing that we have here is uh, we do have a, a ditching oh, uh, said a hatch emergency up at, hatch up there right above the co-pilot. So well, co-pilot out first. Huh? Co-pilot out first. <laughs> Either that or I'll be using them as a stepping stone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Let's go. I didn't see that window yeah, opens. That's yeah. It. This one opens. We don't have a no, window the, on that side. So yeah, the, the co-pilot gets the one upgrade. one amenity but not the other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's yeah. cool. So what are all these? So this is this is your flight control. This tells yeah, you where you are. It's a that's GPS. That's your navigation GPS. Sure. Uh, we've got a weather radar here. Oh, wow, cool. um, and that is actually is that built into the nose of the plane, or is that? Yep, yep. Right at the very no front cone okay. there. There's the the radar that's working yeah. and uh, giving us the information here. Um, our engine instruments. Yep. Our uh, uh, right here is our TCAS. So when we're operating in the fire it, traffic environment, we're amongst other aircraft, sure. tankers, and the air attack, and other helicopters. And so uh, there's times when we basically only have 500 foot separation vertically, and uh, we're uh, in orbit with, or as opposed to the air attack, it's actually in opposite direction orbit. So uh, with a 500 foot separation, we might we're be pretty close, coming yeah. at each other. <laughs> And so the uh, the TCAS is uh, displayed over our weather radar. So you, you so, can see the aircraft superimposed yep, over. Yeah, superimposed in there, and uh, and then yeah, your typical six pack. Yeah. Airspeed, altitude, and yeah, and then uh, we do have uh, uh, an AOA system sure. installed on this. Okay. Uh, a lot of the older aircraft back in that day didn't have that. After we got it from the Air Force, we had that installed. Is that just so you know you're flying level? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, well, it's, it's to keep you from getting into a stall right. uh, scenario, so, yeah. 
better stall awareness yeah, for yeah. you. You know, we're yeah, doing a lot important. of a lot of turn in, tight turn in, and uh, of course, you know, it's going to increase your stall speeds, and and so we the indications up here, and, okay, you yeah. know, and on our uh, approaches uh, for final for landing, you fly the green donut, but yeah. what in our smoke jumper profile, <laughs> sure. we want to get slowed up for the jumpers to go out the door. Right. So we'll get we'll set our uh, AOA to about 1.3 of stall, and then uh, we've got the indication we'll get it on the donut, and that's what we're trying to do is fly the donut. I'll be uh, basically flying the pitch for the donut, and then my co-pilot, he's running the power. Sure. And uh, if we're descending and I'm on that donut, he'll just add a little bit more power. To power is our altitude there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what is the typical speed when you're actually jumping, when you guys got, when you have guys jumping off the back? Yep, the we're, speed? Uh, we're typically, uh, when we first take off, you know, we're pretty close to max gross, and if the fire's close by, we may only have burnt off about a half hour of fuel. So uh, at those weights, the first stick of jumpers is going out about 100 knots. Sure. And then uh, each stick of jumpers is average about 500 pounds. So by the time we get to the last stick of jumpers, we might be down to about 92, okay. 93. It's not terrible. No, not bad at all. And, and they uh, seem to like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> the slower the better. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, uh, any other questions? No, well, how long did, does it take you? So, if you came from Montana, yep. Um, uh, did you do it all in one? We did it in one day, one, hop, uh, okay. one stop, one fuel stop in uh, Rapid, like I said, and then uh, it was uh, just under six hours flight okay, time coming terrible. out here. We threw out about 175 uh, knots, but we had a really good tailwind, <laughs> yeah, uh, and we were showing on the GPS we were going about uh, 225 across the ground. Wow, so that's great. So we, that was that was. <laughs> it's not going to be that way. No, going, going back it'll be a lot longer. <laughs> going home, I think uh, we'll expect probably about six and a half hours flight time. Yeah. Uh, with a fuel stop. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, uh, they got the capacity uh, for four and a half hours of fuel, 4,500 4, pounds. Um, yeah, that's a little bit more than the civilian version sure. of this. The civilian version, I had uh, a little bit smaller tank. So this is considered a military aircraft? This is. It was built for the Air Force. Uh, it went to the Air Force, and they used it for six years, and sure. now we've used it for 28 and, years. And the Forest Service only flies the military version? Uh, the Forest Service has only military, yeah. Uh, the B models were Army National Guards. Okay. So we, we really, and, and the reason for that is is that they, this, what makes it a Sherpa versus a, a civilian 330 yeah. is that rear door. Okay. So the functionality and the purpose built for uh, being, you know, what, a Sherpa, yeah. that's that's what we're after. And any other, let's go look at the outside if you okay, don't mind. Yeah, let's you got some take time. Take a look at the outside. I see some, some features of the aircraft. Watch your step. Yep. <laughs> So this is so, so. Tell me about some of the features of the plane. Like, what okay. are the characteristics of the, that that make this plane unique? Well, what's really unique about the Sherpa is is that the fuselage. If you'll notice, the top of it has actually a kind of a curvature, oh. and it's flat on the bottom. Sure. There is a lift coming from the fuselage. So there's the shape of the fuselage yep. itself it's, has. It's, air, a, air. it's a lifting surface. The uh, stub wing for the gear. That's also a lifting surface. So uh, with all that, that's part of the lift total equation. Sure. And so that's why we can get away with such small, small wings, wings yeah. for uh, a yeah. vessel of that size. Um, it helps for a couple reasons. Uh, got hangers that uh, will fit this, this yeah. aircraft as opposed to like a twin otter. Uh, it won't fit in the, one of the hangars that we have in Mile City that this will. Sure. Uh, and that's simply because also the, the having the twin tail for the ramp also makes it so that shorter you can have a, yeah. a shorter uh, profile on the vertical stabilizer. So they can fit in a sh smaller door. Has any of these ever landed like on a highway or anything, like emergency landing? Because it looks uh, like with the shorter wing, it would be a little safer than yeah, most airplanes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> knock on wood, it hasn't happened. Right. We haven't had to yet, but yeah, yeah it, you would fit in a tighter spot like that right. if, if an emergency needed it. The high engines, everything. Yep, yep. Uh, 
And that's kind of nice, the high engine. We, we actually operate these up in Alaska, and a lot of the backcountry strips there in Alaska are gravel. Right. So, and uh, having the prop up away from the gravel and not sucking up all the, the dust and dirt from the tarmac is quite so, so readily as a, a low wing aircraft. Would you gauge this as a high maintenance aircraft or is it pretty robust do you think? It, it came to us and uh, when we were first operating there seemed to be like a lot of maintenance that, but we had to get kind of caught up to what the quirks were for this aircraft. Yeah. After 28 years, this has been a really reliable uh, aircraft. Found, uh, found the maintenance crew. Yeah, and, yep. and, yeah. and uh, in our seasonal kind of you know work, winter has spent a lot of time doing all winter maintenance so that it's up and ready, up and ready for all the uh, uh, firefighting that we have to do during the summertime. So. And we lose, we we don't lose very much uh, availability at all with these aircraft. What is the fire season? You said it's like, is it just summertime, or is it is there like a typical window that there's? The yeah, and, and fire season kind of moves from uh, different regions at, sure. for different times of the year. Yeah. So, uh, uh, actually, uh, an early fire season could start for like the tankers and stuff uh, as early as in February. Uh, down in like the southeast sure. uh, Florida and all that kind of stuff. But then uh, Alaska will start their fire season, you know, around April and uh, uh, May, June, their brunt of it is June, May and June, and then uh, start dwindling in middle of July. Do they, do they move that, you guys around or is it? Yep, yep. So, you know, uh, typically we'll have this airplane up in Alaska sometime in, in June and July. And then it's about mid-July, things are starting to slow down up there, and fire season will uh, pick up in our region, in Montana and, and uh, the Pacific Northwest over in Washington and Oregon and California. Sure. And so then our fire season will kick off, and it seems like California uh, will hang on to fire season a, a lot longer. later yeah. into the fall as opposed to up where we're at in Montana. And the smoke jumpers, are they local or do they go with you? The, well, we've got, like I said, we got all the jump bases in okay. the different uh, parts of the western U.S. Sure. So wherever the activity is, the jumpers are a national resource. Okay. So wherever the activity is and the need is, we'll send jumpers from other bases to help boost the bases that are uh, actually actively yeah. working. So that's a commitment. You're a smoke jumper. You're, you yeah. can be moved around. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, when you wake up, you never know where you're going to be yeah. until that you're there that night. You're not just a fire any firefighter. You could have to travel that's on, right. on a daily basis. So the, the smoke jumpers are uh, very experienced firefighters. Before they become a smoke jumper, they've probably already got four or five years of uh, firefighting experience. Sure. So that when they come and rookie as a smoke jumper, uh, all they're being trained for and then the rookie uh, training yeah. is to how to get out of that airplane, <laughs> you know, and it's a three, four week process to get them trained up. So they typically from a firefighting background first and then have yep. to learn how the, yep. the ins and out of, yep. of aviation. The, the, the smoke jumper community, when they're getting these rookies, they don't want to teach them fire. Yeah. They should already know that. Yeah. It's just a new method of getting to that fire that they're being trained up on. And as soon as, as, soon as they hit the ground, they're not really a jumper anymore. Yeah. They're a firefighter, that's, that's, and just that's their, way of... their primary job. How about that? Why would you like to go to work every morning? And your first, thing, how you get to the job site is you jump out of an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I walk to work every day. That's, my, that's pretty, right. Uh, my life is pretty boring that's by comparison. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, Shane, thank you very much for yeah. showing us around. It's my pleasure. Yeah, and thanks for doing what you do. This is awesome. Thank I think you. a lot thank of people you. are depending on you to do this, and I appreciate it, I know. Thank you. Well, till next time, it's been another episode of Brickmania TV. Right on. <laughs>